record? <laughs> Good. Thanks. So let's get started. We're uh, very happy and very honored to have today Melanie Meng Xue, who um, is now at the LSE, uh, who was before at NYU Abu Dhabi, if I'm correct. And she's going to be, um, so Melanie has done a lot of work. Some of us who are more on the history side are familiar with her work on folklore. She's published uh, very well. That work on folklore is now at the QJE. She's had a paper also in explorations in economic history. Uh, works really interesting at the intersection of history and culture. And today, Melanie is going to be talking about the short and long run effects of affirmative action uh, with evidence from Imperial China. So Melanie, the floor is yours. Um, so I'll just before that, I reiterate, um, Lenin's happy to take questions along the way. So if you have questions, you can um, either ask them in the chat um, by written or say that you have a question and I'll give um, the, the possibility to talk to each one of you. I'll be monitoring the chat and you can also raise your hand and we'll monitor that as well. Uh, so Melanie, you can focus on your presentation. I'll try to share this. Okay. Uh, the floor is yours now. Uh, sounds great. Thank you, Laura, for inviting me. Um, I'm also very honored to present at the um, Political Economy Seminar of um, the UK, and it's very nice. Um, it's, it's still within the first week I'm here, <laughs> so um, I find this is to be a great way to start. Um, so, okay, so the paper is about the uh, um, a reform in imperial China, but with general generalizable insights for affirmative action. So today, I think this is still at early stage. So you're very, very much welcome to to give um, give me lots of feedback, and I'm very much looking forward to that. All right. So I will begin with just to give you a brief introduction to the reform I'm speaking about. And so imperial China enacted a reform in 1712 that benefited the unprecedented and underrepresented the provinces and the national exam. So another thing that sent this reform, I'll give a bit of a background on, on the national exam. So in the economic history literature, we're trying to study the imperial exams of China um, because it is an important institution of the imperial China. It is the fun very foundation for uh, developing human capital, but also it is important for uh, social mobility purposes in imperial China. But what happened in 1712 is then the decision was taken to, uh, to diversify the pool of the candidates, also to diversify, especially the pool of the successful candidates. And this brings a parallel to a modern affirmative action in many respects. So later on, I will uh, explain how, how it differs. So it also differs in important ways, but here I will, come, um, I will focus on the the similarities or the analogous aspects so that we can uh, see how you know, what kind of lessons you can learn or can, uh, can, uh, can, can be useful to make history useful for um, modern day insights. So the imperial examination system, um, so broadly speaking, it is, a, it is an institution, it's an instrument that, that selects qualified in individuals to step the democracy. So this is the goal of this institution. So it has a very clear political purposes. Uh, but at the same time, you can think of this as a, an in an intended consequence is it does draw individuals to prepare for the exam and then accumulate human capital along the way. And it is viewed as open and fair as compared with many other substitute. Uh, it is a relatively transparent system. And then the system has three tiers, which you know, has this many tiers of layers of exams, so which then requires individuals to pass, pass, pass them sequentially. So you cannot take the high level exam without first passing the lower level exams. And then accordingly, there are three degrees available for the strict exam. There will be the Shenyuan degrees, and then the provincial exam has the Zhiren degree. And then the metropolitan exam, and uh, when will acquire a Jingshi degree once they pass the exam. So, so today, a, a lot of this would really just be about the, the final stage of this system, uh, the metropolitan exam, and the, also the successful candidates come out of this would be the Jingshi. And then um, just to briefly review this timeline, so this is reform we're talking about, but then there is a series of key events that are leading up to this reform. So I would like to be like, perfectly open about this so then uh, we know what is the some of the related events or the, the background for this reform. 
So the reform, the preceding this reform, there is uh, already a, a, some, a number of interventions. So um, Broughton can think of this as a, some alteration of the, uh, the fully uh, nationwide competition we, uh, in the, um, in the uh, effective form. So which the reason for this is because as early as 1397, is already in, there was already a, a big uh, watershed event, which has a bit unusual. There's several things that has led to this, but what the the, feat, the main feature of this is that there was absolutely no candidate from North China past the exam at all. So this is supposed to be a national exam, and China is uh, divided into North and the South. And, and what happened is then there was no candidate from the North to pass the exam. Well, so this triggered a big de debate in, uh, within the, uh, the uh, mostly among the elites or among the officials um, and then pro court that this, this is the, a sensible situation because given that over time, then over time, they were just have a, no, no representation from the North at all. So following this, uh, not immediately after, but after about 30 years, then they took this decision to divide the candidate pool into two. Now, from that point on, there's the South China can have up to 60% of the odd slots and the North China will have 40%. So it is still based on the performance, but then there is also a, a code that been imposed on um, these two parts of China. Therefore, it, it will not be, uh, will not be again in this situation of the absolute have no one coming from North China at all. And then by 1454, this decision has gone further. You can think of this reform as a further deepened, but into three exam regions. The reason for this is because the central region, it was and all these areas that later belonged to the central area, uh, you know, um, the, you know, the, the central government realized that, that there is a, a number of those prefectures there geographically situated somewhat between the south and the north, and they were a bit marginalized, so they often don't get any seats. And they are a bit different in, in politically and economically from the both, both uh, south and the north. So then they, they are getting their own seats, I guess, in Columbus and the exams. So then that's the, that's the situation that before there is this real reform I'm talking about here in 1712, which is the recruitment by province system. So the reform, just a little bit more on this, um, it was initiated um, by the Kanxi Emperor. So he is, um, so he, his, so his grandchild in Channel Empire is probably somewhat more famous because he made the cover of Economist several times has been known to be a, a bit, um, a, a bit of an auto, autocratic. Uh, so, so I think it's the usual impression, and also a little bit stubborn. So the Kanxi Emperor is about a bit few generations before him, and then and uh, during his reign, there were several reforms being proposed, and one of this is is the reform to the exam system. So under this reform, the new rules specifies that the successful candidates would always be a proportion to the number of participants. So then the advantage of this is there is as long as there are uh, participation, then they will have some successful candidates. So in terms of uh, the actual consequence of this is it led to more underrepresented provinces, that's more success in those parts. So I can show you then later in the graph that this is indeed the case that the, the last areas and the provinces with the lower share before and then after the reform, they do have a higher share and up having a higher share. And I think the core feature of this is the competition. The nature of the competition has really changed. So instead of having a national competition, now the only person who or the only people who are looking at your chance will be others from the same province. So therefore, it also means the criteria has really begun to vary from province to province. It's no longer a national competition. So this is what the edict looks like by the constant emperor. So this also states some of his motivations or concerns. So obviously there'll be cynics who have questions about how, how genuine this is, but this is what he said. Participation in imperial exams has increased nationwide. However, many participants of um, humble, humble background traveled a thousand miles to attend the exams, but failed to pass. I am deeply troubled by this situation. From now on, we will wait until all attendees gather in the capital with then set provincial quota based on the turnout of each province. Participants will be ranked based on their performance relative to others. So here means others from their province. So this is what the, 
the imperial addict suggests. And so it also pretty much tells you the rule I just mentioned about uh, now it's really it's within com province competition and it really depends on uh, only everyone else from the same province. So below, I think before I get into more history or more in, or empirical analysis of the data, I wanted just to show you walk you through the affirmative action literature in case you're not familiar with it already. So in terms of the, the, the topic is, is being always in the media. So I don't think anyone have any question about that. But in terms of the literature is a bit of a, um, um, it's, a, it's, it's interesting. So there are several, several things that's always been discussed in terms of, uh, you know, what is counts as a, a best practice you know, affirmative action. So this is a, a, a theory paper and JP discussed these two traits. One is non-contractable um, and the other is being, uh, it should be uh, ideally implemented at the exposed stage. Uh, so the reason for this is because if it's contract, you know, so the identity can easily be swapped and then there is a very high, there's a, lot, a great incentive for people to just to pretend to be in that little group. So therefore to, to reap the rewards or to reap the benefits of being in in the group that now is being um is 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 being especially taken care of around this, put it this way, and then the ex post stage I think and um, in the paper it really is goes into details about why it's is an important condition. So intuitively, this is just if it intervene too early, then it causes too much dis distortions, then it might have actually discouraged skill development. So the ideally should have this being um, performed, being implemented at the last stage of the exam, so um, um, of the human capital in development. And indeed, uh, this is what the, the imperial exams looked like. So as I introduced earlier, that the metropolitan exam is the very last stage of the exams. So it kind of coincides with, with what the literature states as the criteria for, for the affirmative action. And then the, the next two references, I think is the most relevant for this paper. Um, both paper talks about the top, the top 10% policies. So one is the, the policy in Texas and the other is in California. So both are residence-based interventions. So in terms of uh, you know, the rule, it would usually be the high schools in either of these two states. And then we'll, as long as the student is ranked in the top 10%, then no matter which high school this is or which school district this is, then there's some kind of a guarantee for uh, the college admission. So they will be able to uh, get into a college and potentially also a pretty good one. So those are the papers. Um, and then they typically, and I think the general conclusions in this literature has been that it looks like this policy intervention was, was effective and it was not just increased the the attendance or the enrollment, but it also often find, you know, the students are enrolled and uh, achieve the higher GPAs. Um, and then in the other, in the Californian case, they were able to derive similar grade value from the more selective uh, university enrollment. So there's um, a few more papers. Um, I think there's also the paper about uh, not really finding a mismatch of fact, which is also a kind of Related to uh, my study, about uh, study with um, Bo Xiaozhang, uh, which is we also find that this candidates once they pass the exam, even though under a very different criteria, they seem to do well. So this is what we also find in our study. All right. Um, so going back to the reform, uh, so I just want to uh, reiterate that we the reform do share some of this best practice characteristics, so which makes it, at least we know what the benchmark is, so it is uh, uh, in line with what the best best practice affirmative action is, which also implies whatever we find might have some generalizable insights for that type of affirmative action. And secondly, the jobs are guaranteed for, uh, for successful candidates and, and with the government being the single employer. So this is just like a simplifies the usual uh, it's, situation which would be involved like a labor market and with many employers each of them will be free to discriminate if they want to so here i don't really have this problem that's more like if you um if they pass the exam then they will uh, they will have a, a matching outcome um more or less and and then at least they will have kind of a, uh, they will have a 
a, a, a job that matches their exam outcomes. So the effects of the reform should go at least uh, a bit further um, in within the generation. And it's another question if this actually persists uh, beyond the time horizon of the reform. So that's a, a different question. Melanie, can I ask yes. a clarification question, please? Mm -hmm. So just uh, for those of us who are not specialists at all in um, the literature on affirmative action, mm -hmm. can you perhaps clarify exactly what the ex post means here? So more precisely, what who would have the policy this one in particular looked like if it was ex ante? So if it oh, was- Oh, yes. A, um, yeah. yeah, I think which it really means here is that you imagine there are several stages for skill development. So there would be an elementary school and then goes to like middle school and high school and the college. Assuming that people don't go pursue further education beyond college, then the college will be will be the exposed stage in this case. So therefore, I think it, it, there is that's why there is a, a bit um, there's a pre and the match or a, or an anal analogous relationship between the modern intervention, which often happens as well in the college uh, stage and with the one um, I'm looking at here. Okay, thank you. Can I also ask a question, an ignorant question about how many provinces are there in, in China at that time? So um, the Qin China has altogether 18 provinces, so one, eight. So our analysis will both take place in that level but also the level below. So we're gonna also be trying to look at the distributional consequences of this reform, which will be um, at the level of both um, prefecture, and in that case, it will be at 267 prefectures, and then also the county level. So the county level will be over a thousand, yeah. Other questions? Yeah, so uh, let me let me go into this a bit more. Um, let's watch the time at the same time. Okay. Uh, what what I get like a reminder <laughs> about the time because uh, I think I don't, I'm not sure if this. We'll is make sure that you get the reminder. <laughs> okay. quarter, quarter two. Okay. Thanks. So I then I also trying to compare this. So as uh, I just like to also point out some of the this, this this similarities or some important differences. So modern affirmative action. So the, without a doubt, right? There are important principles behind modern affirmative action. It is you is motivated by this concern for um, there's a historically disadvantaged group is because they're being um, and also they suffers from discrimination and exclusion and. And this is in at odds with having equality and the rights for all the citizens. So this is the, uh, what the background for the modern affirmative action. And usually there will be also a targeted level of increased diversity. So this is the explicit goal of um, affirmative action of modern time. So the Chinese reform at the time, I want, um, so it is a, a, one thing for sure is it is it obviously it was not a time you had like a very clear notion of civil rights. This is a, out of the question, so this is not really part of the meaning of this reform. But it's indeed in, in, embedded in is the uh, some very pre very pre modern egalitarianism. So it's a, a, a prototype of the egalitarianism. So therefore, they will be also thinking about just how to extend opportunities to formally disadvantage the groups and how to achieve a form of equality under this reform. Then the contribution of this paper will potentially we can achieve the following goals. One is it obviously is a pretty large scale policy experiment. And it, it went on for um, over 200 years. So from the point of uh, a little under 200 years. So from the point of 17, well, so this continued until the end of the Qing Dynasty, almost reaches uh, 19, uh, 19, 1905, all the way until the end of the imperial exams. And then secondly, um, this is also an obvious way to investigate if the effects of this reform um, pan out, you know, both within the time the reform was was in existence, but also afterwards. So it does have a particularly long time horizon to be explored. 
Um, but more importantly, which we're interested in, and also what the data allows us to do, is to study how the gains were shared. So here, I think it's related to one of those papers um, study the FM2 action as the distribution. And we can use this uh, very similar idea. Also, their conclusions is also very similar to what, we, uh, what is in our paper. And so we consider this as a, as a similar, very important model we are following, which finds that the gains were more likely or the more concentrated in areas that, uh, or in groups that were subgroups that were more prepared than um, before the reform. So that's also what we find. And then in terms of spillovers and mechanisms, so this is a still very early stages. Our paper has not really gone very far in that direction, but we have tried one or two things just to see what, what are the ways to, to cons consolidate the gains of this reform and uh, make it more evenly distributed if possible. Okay, so I will um, get into the data section now. Um, so just to uh, remind you about the, the the administration structure. So the Chinese bureaucracy has this three tiers. And, um, so I think earlier question uh, by Max was also touched upon this point. So there's 18 provinces and 267 prefectures, and then there's over a thousand counties. So, uh, so this gives some variation, I think, in studying the distributional consequences of this report. And then we use the panel data. So this includes successful candidates for the metropolitan exams, but both it's how many of them, but also the ranking and also their placement. And then at the same time, you also have data for the prefecture characteristics. And there could be more um, being added to regression if needed. But right now we are focusing on the three things, um, the calorie suitability index. So this gives some idea about how, how, you know, how well off these areas are in the pre-modern metric. And then it's also the population density, which is, should be closely mapped into the caloric suitability index, uh, but also the, 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 the number of uh, candidates were able to pass the lowest level index. So this has been poorly determined by the government, which we believe could be also be a, a, you know, an additional variation in, in the human capital accumulation, independent of all these other attributes. And, so those are the traits we're focusing on, and usually they serve as controls in our regressions. And so just to come back to this reform uh, for a second, and I'll show you a little bit about the, what, what, what it actually looked like and then, um, when, when there was, um, so with, with all this data we already collected. So the reform was, it was adopted to, to boost the representation of a poor or more gross part of the country. Country, so this is uh, at least that, that is being implied in the imperial edict, and then we proxy the magnitude of this reform. Right, this is mostly the province level. What is, and then with the change in the province's share of things before and after the reform, and then we find the direction of the change to be inversely correlated with initial shares. So this is almost just a different way to say that it wants to boost the representation of the poor and the more remote parts of the country. So put it on the graph, this is what it looks like. So you have this change series or the initial series from the previous period on the x-axis, and then having a change in this series on the y-axis. What happens is then previously had a higher share, and now the change is, is uh, almost, almost always going to have either just like a smaller increase or even just going negative. So here, I think this is the zero uh, line. So you see some of the stats are, are negative means it has a, a, a decrease in the shares. And then similarly, we can do this by the labels. So this is, it shows you all those provinces there is, and then by three different exam regions. Right? So it's also very similar a pattern you see, and uh, it's just with labels. It's the same graph as the first one. And then we can change and use a slightly different way to calculate this, uh, this change in the shares. Therefore, there will be a longer time series, a, a longer, more data available, um, and that shows that you have also an inverse relationship. And then lastly, just a bit of a note on boundaries, because there's this issue of having boundaries evolved over time. And then we have to uh, take this into account and, and making sure that this, this boundaries or units that can be tracked over time. So that's basically it. And there are some of the examples, I think, um, you know, just think most general so now where those are provinces, um, 
but they are not units we really study. So we combine the northern parts of these two provinces or the southern parts of these two provinces. They've, so they're so they're uh, more aligned with the exam regions or the historical provinces. So that's a uh, no, we think of this as artificial provinces. And then just to give an example, I think it was pretty, should be pretty clear from the previous slides, but just to give an example about what exactly happened. Um, so imagine there's two provinces, province A and B. And then in the previous period, they each had a number of candidates passing them. And then together, they, they are all provinces within the region S. So that what happens is then they are all uh, taken up a share of all the successful candidates in the region S when uh, the province A would be accounting for 30%, and then province B will be about 10%. So what happens after the reform is the province A would sort of decline in, in the share, of this share, whereas the province B will see an, uh, an increase. So this is just like an a, a illustration of how, what, what we mean by having an inverse relationship between the change in the shares and its, inver in, its in initial shares. So here I to show you the first set of results. So and this is on the province level. So province level is very little we can do because this policy is being, you know, it's directly targeted to the province level. So at least within the time horizon where the reform was in place, we should expect nothing, but that there is a fact because that's almost the mechanic. But what we can indeed, we can still do in this, in this stage is to look at how does the candidate quality and their long-term outcomes react or respond to this reform. So what we find in this case is that when you look at these individuals and their ranking in the exam, the provinces where they were experiencing an increase in the shares is also seeing the increase in the exam ranks. So it looks like it's it's not the case that they were just like, they were less uh, they were less competent people or individuals. So at least over the long run, that the provinces are underrepresented and, and now have an increase in the number of successful candidates also have an increase in their performance. So we do the same at the both individual and the province level and their the results are highly similar. And then more, perhaps more, more interesting or more interested to the audience would be um, how there is that long run replacement or thinking of this as professional outcomes change after the reform. So this is also driven by a, a just similar a, a direct, a direct parallel to think about how this, um, if you have a more enrollment in a college, so what does that exactly mean? Does that translate into higher earnings? Does that translate into better jobs? Um, or even when we condition the job on a government order, then does that translate into a, a better performance on the jobs? So roughly speaking, we're thinking of this, the final placement, which is what this placement here refers to, as going to be a summary of those things. Um, so here we find a little bit of this, it's not, it's not entirely clear, so, but there is some indication of also a positive outcome. And then we did this in the province, then it's a bit more clear. So there's indeed, it uh, looks like there's also an increase in, in, the, in, in their placements. So their placements also got better over time. And some of the differences between Collins or just if we also control for some of these controls um, interacted with the decade trends. So I think that's the main differences. And also the treatment we are using. There is also the treatment of using the the, the 200 years time, um, period between the 1450 and 6050, when there is already the three exam regions, or we use it the period before. So for this, the second the treatment, which you know, we are able to just compare the share uh, with the time when there is just a national competition and, and then no other barriers. So we can do it most ways. All right, so-, Hi, um, uh, so Melanie. Yeah. Sorry, can I um, ask again a question? So perhaps I didn't understand this very well. So with regards to your first, so the first result, this is the ranking of people at the exam? Yes, so for the ranking results, these are just exam ranks. So this hasn't, hasn't, really, uh, hasn't really gotten to the job. 
stage. So this is just yeah. how they did in the exam. And so I think. But yeah. then that how how do how are we supposed to think about this? So if mm -hmm. if we think about inclusion policies in places where the, they're national exams, so still in China today, I believe, or in France, typically the argument is to say that you want to go towards the candidates who for you know institutional reasons are more likely to be underranked so how do, how should i understand the fact that with the policy people are getting better ranks so if, if the ranking is better then the policy was unnecessary right so how yes, how so are we supposed think, yeah. to to understand this so i think if you look at it just like one term just like one exam then perhaps it would be hard to get this kind of a results right but here is more many more decades so this what you, i think what we're reflecting is that over time those candidates gets better okay so put this in i just no one comes like no one even tries because it's like i haven't heard anyone ever go to the exam but okay, so it's time, really yeah. a you know i'm gonna go and try like the best people actually people, try because it yeah, makes sense okay yeah thank you really involved in, yeah and then this is, is actually consistent with the findings of, of these two paper. <laughs> they also study a very similar reform, 10% policy um, in California and uh, um, California and the Texas. And it also is, I think over time, they also find it's increase in GDP for those candidates, uh, GPA, <laughs> and for those candidates who, who were recruited um, from the member representative groups. Yeah. yeah, you have also an extra question from Charlotte Zan. Um, hi, Melanie. Um, two related questions. Um, one is that, is there any possibilities with the migration explaining the result? As you are basically ex um, um, comparing the, um, the individuals from the previous dynasties versus the one in the Qing dynasty with the regime switch. So I can imagine, for example, some scholars, they don't like the new regimes, uh, which is from the Manchuria. So they, they might just migrate it to further away areas, which happens to be um, the places that was underrepresented in the exam before. So that was the first question. Um, the second question is more about, I guess, the robustness about mm -hmm. the results. If you exclude the uh, Yunnan and Guizhou provinces, does that your result still go through? Because in the previous diagram that you show, it seems that the negative cor correlations was mainly driven by the two dots on the left tops, which I believe is Yunnan and Guizhou provinces. Uh, if you exclude that two provinces, how does that result looks like? So yeah, the two I think dots. you're looking here. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah sure. Uh, so, I mean, your question about migration is very good. I think we've experimented with also a version which accounts for population changes, which is not really changing the results. And I think in terms of the scholars moving to like the frontier, I think this is actually very unusual. I don't think that actually happened in that, in that, in that direction. So the Chinese frontier is mostly settled by people who are, um, who, who can you know, just under certain pressures can no longer live in the area they, they used to be in. So I think this is more about like push out start, but also it's like military, it's military um, conquered frontier. And so therefore there's also ethnicity angle uh, there uh, as well. Um, so your question about the Yunnan and the Guizhou, I don't think so. Um, I think our relationship is actually pretty robust. If we just exclude them and look at this one here, you still might as have the same negative downward trend. So I think I might, I'll double check if this is the case, but my impression is it doesn't. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, I don't know what happened. Okay. So let, let me um let me let me then move on to like our main focus of this study. So before I think it's mostly just to uh, to like confirm some of these effects you think might might be associated with affirmative action across the groups but here i think we're going to begin to look within the groups which is really the focus of the study and what the data is able to, to do um all right so so again just the setting um i should just remind you of the setting of this again so this the reform is 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 going to is almost just designed to have to lead to an increase in in the share of the distinction for those previously underrepresented provinces so that part is actually really not surprising because it could just easily be be done in that in that way right it, it's like it, if the government was not even able to achieve that goal then it almost like it just means there is no capacity but it was able to do that and then the question really is how does those gains were shared 
Um, I think this has also been a, 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 a lot of relevant interest in the recent literature because we really care about um, how within the groups, how this, um, how can we make sure that it, it actually is, 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 uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, a productive or fruitful um, intervention. So then, so then what happens is then we're trying to think about like how specifically the series of genes changes in the sub, sub-provincial units, um, namely the prefectures and the counties, uh, which differed in their pre-existing strings in human capital. So this is also obvious point because, I mean, in you think about the United States, we, we think, you know, there is a different reasons, but here I think it's just resorting. You have, you know, New York probably has people where, you know, there's more years of um, education than um, some small towns in, um, in, the, in the heartland of the United States. So it's a similar thing. Like, I think you have those differences, and then the question will really be how those are, how those, um, how those sub, sub provincial units can take advantage of these reforms, and it both in the immediate short run, but also over the long run. And then below, we're going to use this uh, prefectures pre. 1650 genes density to proxy its strengths in the human capital prior to the reform. And then we'll estimate the heterogeneous impact of this reform on the genes density varying by the prefecture's pre existing strengths in human capital. And I'll show you a map just to see how this works, right? So we have obviously a difference in, in the genes density, both nationally but also within those provinces. So the, the Hunan province, and it looked like there was darker shades areas, but there was also a much, much lighter shades. There was areas so we barely had any junction. So then we can use this at um, main um, equation to do this following exercise. So this might be more complicated than it should be, but it just be uh, so the, the importantly, like, this is a prefecture decade analysis, and then. The Jingshi density is just the density of the Jingshi in prefecture P during the decade D. The decade D is from 1650 to 1830. So this is just pre and post periods of the reform. And then the beta one and both beta one and beta two are our coefficients of interest. So we're interested in how does this affect those um, prefectures and, and counties in the provinces that benefited from the reform and those who saw declining shape. So in terms of the Delta share province, this is just the post reform share of the provinces in the respective exam region, relative to its share in the earlier period. So this is the, the, um, the main estimation of preferred specification, but we also use an alternative treatment just to show the robustness. And then I have some of the controls to control for the prefecture fixed effects, and, but also decade fixed effects. So using this framework and then also with the controls we already mentioned earlier, you can get this main table over here, which, um, which would suggest the following. So for first, for these prefectures that with more Jingshi before, um, and, but also is in a province that has gained from the reform or has increasing share, uh, but very in a very similar way for the provinces that had a solid declining share. So for each of the two, what happens is that if they had more jingshi to begin with, then they end up also benefit more from this reform. Um, so this is, and we'll read this, so we look at this results, um, so estimate this for all the periods afterwards. Um, does this is to say that this appears to be a sum in um, some inequality in how this how these gains were distributed, and in the column three and the column four, what we do is we just like don't look at the other provinces at all, and by just focusing on provinces that gained from the reform or those who lost, and then it's very similar as well. So there isn't really a difference. Um, I think the also coefficients are very similar. So we just here just look at a subsample each time. And then we do the same um, analysis, but with a slightly different treatment. So then we can compare the shares between the initial time, but also with the, a slightly longer period of post-reform. And it's also is very similar patterns. 
So to visualize these results, I draw them on this um, but by period, and then you can tell how the effects of this reform evolved over time. So basically, it's it's very similar. Um, it, it's it's a it's a bit more obvious for the provinces that have lost or uh, not lost out in the reform. That it seems like this is widening gap. So here is really is comparing prefectures with more Jingshi versus with less, but within the same province. So this is to, this is uh, already at the sub provincial level, and it is to say that this this gap seems to be widening um, between those prefectures over time. So it looks like there is just there is an initial difference in how the gains were shared, but these differences have only been perpetuated over time. So this is our main results and main conclusions um, by this point. Um, I, we're trying to try, trying to move on a bit. I think we're I mean, about like what ten minutes, fifteen minutes left. Yeah. So you've got 15, 16 okay. minutes. All right. So I would make sure to finish this within like six minutes, so then I have some more time to to ask your questions. So yes. So um, I think what uh, more I did here is uh, like one is to experiment with a different treatment. So then this. It's going to be, um, so we are just like going to sidestep some of the complications with the exam regions because I think that's always a bit choppy. And then just look at national shares, you know, share in the whole country. And I find pretty similar results, and although we lose some of the positions for some of the coefficients in this case, and then do the same with a longer uh, treatment period. But those are just robustness. And yeah, so it's not here actually anymore. Um, though this is just to do the same analysis, but at the county level. So here we get some more observations because there's uh, over a thousand counties in China. And then we find uh, still very similar patterns. So it's counties with the uh, largest number of Jingshi that has benefited the most from the reform. And this is regardless of being in the province uh, that have gained shares or lost. So for those who have lost shares, that just means that the provinces with the most change before has have not lost as much. So that's how I think that's how to interpret the coefficient. And then lastly, so here's the question I think I initially also promised to investigate, which is um, is there anything that stops this kind of a trend? So funding agencies, I think it's possible a possible candidate. Um, it's probably not a sufficient condition, but it does look like if the area where's a, a funding agency with during this period, then you don't see as much of a divergence but, uh, between those prefectures. So the reason for this is because the long distance travel is costly. So if every candidate we just decided that you know there is no chance, then they would just not go. So there is some elasticity in there. And then if there's funding agencies that was organized and um, that's just set up to provide a grant, which is what they do those exam participants, then you imagine there will be a little bit more participation and they are more like, less likely to get discouraged even when the odds have seemed to have been going down. And then we then examine how does this affect the, the divergence, we just observe the document very. So as you can see that what happens is if you look at the subsample of prefectures do have a, a, a founding agency, uh, by the year of 1712, which is when you had a reform, or by the end of this period we look at, then you have uh, no results. So basically, if you place with a funding agency, then it, you don't really see that kind of divergence pre between prefectures. And in this, the prefectures with a lot of, uh, without any of those funding agencies, that this divergence is the most pronounced. So this is a uh, um, this is actually something I just put in this morning. <laughs> I've had this new result for a while, but this is one thing I'd like to show you. I think it's 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 quite interesting to think about, and I I I would like to investigate this a bit further and in terms of what, why exactly this is the case, um, and there could be other explanations for the absence of the divergence. Uh, but here, I, as you saw, this is like a civil lining as well, um, because it does tell us that. There are things we can do to, to prevent this type of divergence. And to summarize, so this reform was an intervention to the examination system. And then it did 
achieve its goal and the intended goal, um, which is to extend opportunities to these underrepresented provinces. I mean, did what it's supposed to do. But at the same time, it, it looked like the gains were really central concentrated in these very few places that had more human capital prior to the reform. Mm, so this means, I guess, in terms of if you're a policymaker, it would imply that there could be a, a more thorough reform or conceive of a reform that is being targeted at a lower level or a more subgroup level. Um, so those are possibilities. Or you can say provide more of the public goods, such as the, the funding agency, that therefore to to, uh, to lower the cost for individuals uh, to, to take these exams. And especially when, when you have uh, uh, starting to see the divergence across uh, uh, sub-provincial units. And then we don't really see the gap close over time. So this is the, in the absence of the funding agency. What we generally see is there seems to be a gap. And the gap, and, and uh, if anything, actually increased over time. So lastly, the, um, I already mentioned about the funding agency. So it does seem to do some of the, um, does seem to at least slow down or even just pre prevent this type of diverging trends. Um, in terms of future work, I wanted to explore the spillovers and McNevins more. So is there any of the reallocation, reallocation of the talent, uh, both across time and space, but also a little bit more on the, uh, the post team period. Um, so for this one, I, I already looked at a bit. Um, I think right now I don't see any, don't see a, a whole a lot because it su suggests that it might not be a a, a very long term impact, which is uh, the reform might not have a persistent impact beyond the beyond its uh, its horizon. So that seems to be what the preliminary results look like. Uh, but this needs to be more carefully examined for sure. All right, so this is all. Um, I'm happy to take more questions at this point. Excellent. Thank you very much for this. So um, we have around 10 minutes more for questions. If people want to ask questions, you can ask them in the chat or you can raise your hand um, and we'll pursue the discussion, I think. So um, I may you know, open the Q&A session uh, myself just in terms of because I, I got a little bit confused mm -hmm. at some point so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for being slow but would you um, would you perhaps have you know an, an interpretation in terms of magnitude so if we can think mm -hmm. about you know just in a very simple term if we think of gaining mm -hmm. and losing places um, how does the policy change you know in terms of how many officials there's going to be per capita right mm -hmm. so how many more people do I have so that, that would be uh, something that perhaps if you have it, that would be quite interested in, in knowing that. Um, a kind of very bold interpretation of what you have. Uh, so if you want to already answer that, and then I have also a further question. Um, okay. Yes. Um, so, um, so, so in terms of the number, like this, the number of um, successful candidates or uh, the the officials that 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 is the hardest I mean, because that part is more of a um, it can be directly controlled right by the state so we didn't really spend a whole ton of time to look at this but we cannot uh we do focus on looking at it, like say the placement how did that improve over time so i think this is a bit more obvious uh in terms of the magnitude in the, uh, so if you because there's all together only this many possibilities you involved from like 0. 0.5 to, to 9 and this is the magnitude. So you can, if you shift to the ship treatment, and then it leads to a, a pretty substantial increase in placement for yeah. these provinces. Yeah, I think my um, my point was really more in terms of storytelling. So mm -hmm. if if you can tell me how many more people in power that represents for each province, that would be interesting. You know, how many more officials you have. You know, that that tells me a story about bureaucracy and that that'd be interesting to have that even if it's a little bit of a wild estimate um, starting from what you've got and if i don't see more questions then i i did have a question because so you went through the maps quite quickly right mm -hmm. so if you can show us the maps that you the, the hydrogen yes uh is that the human capital map or the yeah so the map oh. yeah those so there we went so we have 
I just wanted you to comment on whether, and I think this is a question that was also asked uh, for you to comment on whether um, we observe more gaining and losing provinces at the periphery. And, and obviously mm -hmm. this idea of building up the state at the periphery is a crucial question at this stage, especially for a state that was so big as China. Um, so yeah. if, if that correlates, whether that matters or not, oh, right? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, I would, uh, so, so maybe it wasn't included here, but when the decision was taken, some of this was pretty explicitly um, made, the points were pretty explicitly made because I think the peripheries were really disadvantaged because they were so far away. Yeah. And it was also very discouraging when they were so far away and when travel all the way to Beijing and they had no one passing them. So it was, I think it was almost uh, a motivation or driver. And in terms of how much they benefited and relative to others, so as you can tell, they really do on this map here, as Charlotte also noticed, they, they, def, they do indeed uh, um, gain a lot, right? So they started off really low. So both of those are periphery provinces. Uh, they started off at the low level. They were like, each of them are only less than 10% of the entire area in them region they're from. Um, then afterwards, they both increased. This is not two, but by, right? They increased by, by at least like 20% in their share. So the peripheries are, um, I think they are benefit, they were main beneficiaries from this reform. But they're not the only ones, but they are very important ones. Okay, so then the further question I would have with regards to that is, given how how strategically important it is to you know to build a bureaucracy and make sure that the arm of the state reaches in the periphery, you know, how how can we make sure that that increase is actually due to the policy itself, right? Or is it not that there was in any case a favoritism that was given to these provinces just or sorry if I get the administrative divisions wrong mm -hmm. um just because you the, the central state has an incentive to put more people there can i also ask similarly the time span that you have here is humongous it's 500 years or, or more mm -hmm. so there could be just development itself so even without the, the policy something that used to be remote may over 500 years could have been become a central province or, or important province. I don't know history enough to... Yeah, I mean, I think this is like almost like a related point. But so for the second question, this is definitely right because there's more provinces returning into more settled areas during this period. So for that reason, so what we do is we're trying to like account for the population change because the population is a big, I think is a big part of this development. Or you can say like a lot of this development is reflected in increasing population. So that's what we are able to do. And then in terms of the strategic consideration, I, I think the, you're, you're right. Like, I do think that one reason they care so much about this or they're worried about projecting the image of like not caring about the frontier is because they're worried that they're just gonna be like diverge, diverge away or becoming like last part of the country. So this was important consideration. And here in this case, I, I just think the, the exams were just becoming it's your purpose, right? So it's, it's like a way to, to bind this nation together. Um, you can think of this as a favor as well. So the question of if there's other favors and the independent favor leads to this outcome, that part, and that's, that's sure, I, I, don't, I can't, um, yeah, that, that part is harder to answer. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't think I can answer. It. But I, I can just say like, even the exam itself, it can almost, almost be, be seen as a, as a favor in, in, in your language, yeah. So, sorry, I, I just missed, uh, um, realized I, I, I don't understand what is an observation here. Is it an exam in a particular year or is it a, 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 an individual? So on this map, this is the share of a whole province in this. No, no in your, in your region. regressions, when you had oh. like 2000 observations, what are these? So those are, depends. So every table is different. So I have to show. <laughs> so the main table, right? So we started with having the, uh, the ranks. So this was um, though those ones are ranks. So those are, um, let's see, wait a second. Oh. Let's go back to the main slides first. So here, 
what we can do is first to look at the just at the province level. But province level can also run to two kinds of regression, both is at the individual level, but just to see what the province, right, the treatment in the province looked like. So this is this these are individuals. Mm. But then also we just like group it into the province, and the, 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 that, that's why there's like far fewer observations. And so this province that came level. This is just 18 provinces. But in the main results, though, it's it's really at the prefecture level. Um, so that's why it has more than 318, but less than like the 10,000 version, because here every unit is a prefecture DAC unit. Th thanks. You have a question from Charlotte? Yes. Um, sorry, this is just a clarification question. I probably missed um, in your early talk. Um, did you, at the early stage, you find there is a effect on the exam rank, but not the placement rank. Is that what you find? Um, so if you aggregate it to province, which is probably the right thing to do, you also find an increase in placements. So let's see. Can I just see yeah. the placement result again? So there is also a, an increase in placements um, over time. So this looks all the way into like 1830. Huh? Mm -hmm. So a hundred years after the reform, mm -hmm. these places begin to produce people and more people, but also better people, people who placed it well, at least like, well in that. Thanks. So do we have more questions? No? So, well, it's actually almost time, but I, um, you know, I suppose if you, you know, before we let you go, um, do you have any kind of wild, even if it's very wild estimate in terms of how this matters for long run development in, in, in these provinces? Yeah, oh, so no. this is a, um, yeah, I haven't really been able to get to this because I find it a bit, a bit difficult to think about it as well. Like it will be the right way to estimate it. Because right now our most solid piece of analysis is really a sub-conventional one, right? So that, that level is a bit hard to, to understand it. Um, but I think this is a very important question, though. I, I, it's also, um, it should be something we, we focus much more on. And one problem is this is the raw data is just, uh, it's not really the kind of data is too convenient to, to explore this. Um, but my personal hunch on this, because, because the, the exams really evolved that the human capital investment of not just like a small use, but a pretty large, segment of the population. So the trickling down of us could be pretty substantial. But based on that line of logic, I think it can be a, a um, yeah, it could be a, you know, a, a non trivial amount of uh, reallocation, um, right, have been stimulated, just like increase the divergence between the prefectures uh, within those provinces. That's uh, so quite, quite possible outcome. Um, but we yeah, need to, I suppose if you so, I don't know if you if this is available, but there is quite a lot of work on um, estimates of development with anthropometric measures in China, right? So, yes. do do we observe um, you know a closing of the gap in provinces that are all things equal, more favored, or things like that? Uh, but I yes. don't know if this. Yeah. Is, this is so we need to do this for the province level. I think it, it would be useful. Um, but what, what I think I did briefly mention now is in the long, like once this reform is gone, we don't even notice like a human capital change for those provinces. Okay. So that could be just like, it, it could, it's, it's probably have not been very, uh, very fundamental, as fundamental as we hope. So, so just, that's just some indication. But in the time when the reform was in place, I think it's quite possible there is quite a lot of uh, development outcomes, but I have not, um, I don't have, um, I have not really looked into that in a systematic way, so I need to do more of that. 
Uh, yeah, thank you. So I see that, so Charlotte, your hand's still raised. I don't know if this is a residual from last time or do you still have a question? Um, that is a residual from the last time, but um, I have a question that wasn't very formulated very well in my head, but I guess I might just say it. Um, so I guess it's related to Valeria's questions previously about whether this, this is just a simply um, privatisms or a state are reaching their hands to those re uh, results. I don't know if that is interesting to see um, what does this reform actually mean to the state instead of just individual mm -hmm. levels in terms mm -hmm. of you know um, state stabilities or state uh, capacity, for example, in terms of you know once they are able to recruit more people in their talent pool, are they able to um, carry out state related such as like tax collections or peace kind of local stabilities kind of things uh, in the local regimes? Uh, it might not be really related to what you are trying to do in this paper, but I'm just curious, I guess. Um, in yeah, terms of could, understanding could, could what yeah. affirmative mm -hmm. actions means from the state perspective and their incentives to mm -hmm. uh, deliver the affirmative actions, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it could be. I mean, I think it's also it actually is a sort of relatively development outcomes, but it's more specific or more in the political economy uh, genre. Right? So I think I can see that um, I can see the, um, the possibility there. I mean, again, like, I guess the province level, like, some of this indeed available as measures. So it's worth exploring. Um, um, yeah, I, I think those are all good, good suggestions about um, yeah, if there's a good also because what you find is that uh, it does help those underrepresented provinces, but it's also increased the inequality within the provinces, yeah. right? So, so it's yeah, uh, so it's both, right? So it's actually hard to know. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Because inequality obviously introduced other problems as well right, without intervention. But that's why I think showing that to the funding agency, when there is funding agencies, then those inequalities are not as much of an issue or it's not as, as severe. I think that's a, it's a result I thought it was interesting um, and to, to, to show. So, but yeah, but I think I agree with you. I think what exactly happened to those provinces was very interesting. Those officials themselves they should, would not help directly because they are obviously placed elsewhere because of the avoidance system. So those are usually being sent to other provinces to work, but they, they, they mean, it can still be an effect and also just you know, simply having more people being, like, trying to acquire human capital. I think that's where most of the outcomes should come from if there is a positive development outcome. Yes. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I think we can say that this is uh, the end of the formal part now so we can stop the recording.